Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on fighting financial crime in the world of blockchain. Uh, let's give another 30 seconds uh, for everyone to join, and we'll get started. Okay, so hello everyone again, and welcome to today's, to, to today's webinar, Fighting Financial Crime in the World of Blockchain. I would like to introduce today's presenters. Alenka Grealish, Senior Analyst at Silen. Alenka will be presenting the adoption of Outlook of Blockchain for Banks and Businesses. She holds an MBA of University of Chicago and has 20 years of experience in consulting group and research. Jill Vinas Arezis, Senior Analyst at Silen. Jill will be presenting the implication for fraud and financial crime. He holds an MBA from Carnegie Mellon uh, has several publications on blockchain and digital payments, and has also 20 years of consulting and research. Jesus Ortiz, Vice President of Product Development at Guardian Analytics. Jesus will be presenting Guardian Analytics' approach to blockchain-related risk. Jesus comes from Oracle, where he was Vice President of Product Development and Release Management, and he has also an extensive experience in financial and practice management at Thomson Reuters. Myself, Eric Tran Lee, I'm Vice President of Product Management at Guardian Analytics. I will be the moderator for this webinar and will also participate to the Q&A session. Uh, I come from Oracle where I led Big Data Security Predictive Analytics as Vice President of Product Management. Some uh, quick housekeeping facts. Uh, you can answer questions, you can ask questions in the qu question box. We will address them either live or by email. Uh, the webinar is recorded, and you will receive uh, a URL link notification uh, as soon as uh, we end the webinar. And uh, please rate and suggest content to improve our webinar series on payment fraud detection and prevention. Without further ado, let's get started with Alenka's presentation. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we thought the best place to kick off is a definition, what do we talk about, um, what do we mean when we talk about blockchain? Um, fundamentally, we're talking about distributed ledger technology, and um, there's a key difference between public and enterprise blockchain. Our, our focus here is going to be enterprise because that's where blockchain is actually going to get executed by yourselves, your clients, um, large corporates, et cetera. In terms of how to think about the differences, we, we thought we'd um, outline three areas that define blockchain and also illustrate the key differences between a public blockchain and an enterprise blockchain. First um, area is shared ledger. Shared ledger um, in a public blockchain is a shared database, a peer-to-peer -peer network. It's open, permissionless, and that's why it's revolutionary. And it has a myriad of advantages from trust. Uh, you don't need to trust intermediaries. You just trust the protocol, the map. Um, it's resilient, it's secure, and it provides a golden source. However, there's a particular need that an enterprise need um, requires to utilize uh, any form of blockchain, and that is it has to be private, permission, there has to be a governance structure, interoperability, and cost efficiency. The second area is data validation and security. Um, the key underpinnings of the public blockchain is a consensus mechanism in Bitcoin. It's called a proof of work. Uh, there are public and private keys um, for security, and the block comes in and that records are grouped into blocks and chained chronologically. The result is data integrity, immutability, um, relatively lower record keeping costs, and critically audit trails. Things can, can be traced. However, for enterprise, you need speed and scal scalability, and that demands alternative consensus mechanisms. 
uh, outside of proof of work. Also, data controls, if you are working with competitors, collaborating with competitors, you, there has to be some level of privacy at, at the transaction level. And some ability to correct errors if, for instance, you're doing a trade finance, um, blockchain, some ability to create a new record or rectify if there were some data entry errors. And of course, at the end of the day, you have to comply with what the regulators decide. Uh, the third area is digital assets. Um, the well-known assets, we, we see the uh, price, price uh, tracking of Bitcoin, Ether, XRP, and, and others. What do these digital assets enable? They enable faster settlement and a lot less expensive uh, settlement. However, for enterprise, you need um, really flexibility, digital representation of any asset. Um, if there is a um, settlement using crypto, there has to be liquidity um, guaranteed. It has to be um, compliant with any regulation. There has to be binding legality and settlement finality. So all these differentiate um, enterprise from public blockchains. And the world of enterprise blockchain is, is moving forward fast. It's not a question of if, but rather when will adoption happen. Today, um, there's probably fewer than 12, 20 blockchain, um, enterprise blockchain in production. But over the next two years, we anticipate um, that there will be increasing live um, use cases, primarily in payments, and, and I'll double click on that shortly. There will be progress in standards and interoperability, and a few companies are going to experiment with internal ledgers. Within three, nine years, there's going to be consolidation typical in any innovative, disruptive um, initiative. There's a, it's kind of Cambrian. There's a lot of initiatives out there, and we're going to see attrition of third-party providers, blockchain islands, as consolidation scale becomes the ultimate goal. And of course, that's going to be underpinned by governance structures, solidifying standards, uh, maturing, and companies um, getting more comfortable uh, testing uh, blockchain for both intercompany and external document exchange. You know, within 10 years, it, it likely will be mainstream. And at least one central bank will issue um, fiat in crypto. And I think that that will definitely tip, tip the scale for companies' um, comfort levels. The biggest uh, adoption drivers to date have been the initiatives by the consortia and tech giants that uh, we have arrayed here. You know, there's um, huge diversity in terms of initiatives from those that are focusing across industries like Hyperledger and Enterprise, Ethereum Alliance, those focusing on banking such as R3 and Ripple's uh, consortium, and specific companies focusing, of course, at the industry level for the uh, tech giants that are building blockchain as, as a service. And those that are focused on banking have gained traction, such as chain and digital asset holding. And JP Morgan um, believes so strongly that they're building their own open platform uh, with Ethereum called called Quorum. So a lot of a lot of big guns um, pushing pushing this into uh, reality. So what, what does reality mean in terms of use case? How, how can we think about how to evaluate um, use cases? Well, we, we developed a two-dimensional framework. Um, and one dimension is value proposition. The more process is slow, costly, there's risk issues, trust issues. Um, it's not transparent, which of course exacerbates trust issues. Um, the more likelihood you, you can get uh, return on investment in, in blockchain. However, on the other hand, um, complexity makes it harder to execute. So you have to gauge complexity, how many participants, processes, how many systems are touched. And we'll, we'll see how the different use cases uh, fall out in, in terms of these dimensions right here. 
So we have the value proposition on the uh, y-axis and the complexity on, on the x-axis. And as, as we see, there's a clustering of payment-related um, use cases in the upper left with cross-border low value being a high value prop and having relatively less complexity. Um, intrabank, the ledger, their general ledger um, being updated through uh, cross-border blockchain. Internal ledger, I've spoken with several companies who are experimenting amongst their subsidiaries, and some even talking about how great it would be to have their own uh, cryptocurrency to, to settle across their subsidiaries. As you move to the right, um, things get more complex, and uh, key areas trade finance, where open accounts is a little less um, challenging than going to financing or outright supply chain tracking. The more complex are cross-border payments, high value, and that's mainly because there's governance issues and regulatory ambiguity today. When you get into the full-blown documentary trade finance, things get really hard. And KYC, why that's a, certainly a nirvana state because it involves so many different entities outside of banking, it is one of the hardest um, use cases to, to get off, off the ground. A scan of what's going on today, as, as we've arrayed here, shows there's much energy, uh, no surprise, in payments. Um, if you look at uh, what's going on with Ripple, Ripple is, has a very big presence in payments beginning um, over four years ago with numerous banks uh, teaming and uh, experimenting with intrabank as well as interbank. Chain um, has teamed with Visa and others to underpin uh, private networks and we see certain standouts in terms of independent players like Veeam that is using a multi-cross-border rail. You know, when they can't close something on a Bitcoin, they will close it on a traditional rail, and so they've proven, proven that multi-rail model. And lots of activity with cross-border low value. That's the lower right-hand corner, especially in emerging markets where uh, this is particularly expensive, opaque, painful, and there's a lot of um, money uh, with migrant workers uh, moving in, in, in these corridors. And it's also worth noting that with the tech giants like Microsoft, SAP, Oracle, um, that this blockchain as a service is really going to push, um, you know, when we do this, update this for 2018, I think it's going to be a very crowded, crowded slide um, moving, moving out. So that's the state of uh, blockchain today. Uh, it, of course, brings key questions around fraud and financial crime, um, given that there's such growing concern and incursions in terms of cyber um, security risk. And so Jill will uh, dive into this, this key topic. Thank you very much, Alenka. Um, and uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar. Um, well, there's certainly no question that um, cryptocurrencies, blockchain will have an impact on fraud and financial crime. And the question is um, what and how to even begin to think about it. And in order for, for us to think about this, we, we really need to go back to the very first slide that Alenka presented, drawing a distinction between cryptocurrencies and public blockchains versus enterprise blockchains, which are private permissioned and something that you know, financial institutions are, are working on. Because if you look at the cryptocurrency space, um, there's certainly a lot of risks uh, that have already demonstrated themselves and have already been witnessed. Uh, so the, there's a lot of evidence-based facts that uh, where we've seen um, certainly examples of uh, fraud and financial crime. And the, we think that the best way to look at it is actually is by the source of vulnerability. As you know, if you take Bitcoin Network as an example, 
Um, that network, it's a distributed ledger, it's a peer-to-peer -peer, um, network, so the users participate in that network directly. Um, and, and the way for them to get onto that network is via you know, what we call it ramp-up infrastructures, basically you know, a series of exchanges and other types of companies, uh, wallet providers that, uh, that can help you get access to cryptocurrencies, uh, convert your fiat currencies into them, and, and then start transacting. And as, as we'll see on the next page, um, the actual levels of fraud and, and the, the potential for fraud in, in each of those three areas uh, are, are slightly different. And, and the question is, you know, why is that relevant for banks? Because banks are not real in this picture. You know, banks don't necessarily participate themselves on the Bitcoin network, as an example. Um, but the fact is that their customers might, uh, or the, those third parties that, uh, that support uh, and, and play in that network, you know, they still need bank accounts, and so you know, by, therefore banks might get exposed to those risks. If you take the enterprise blockchain story, the, the story there is, is rather different. And, <clears throat> and the, the, the main characteristic of it is that uh, much of it is yet remains hypothetical. It hasn't been proved, hasn't been demonstrated yet. Um, as Alenka said, there's a lot of activity and uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of proof of concept. Uh, some of it is even live, but it's really too early to tell yet uh, in terms of the specific fraud impact, uh, whether that's a positive or a negative. We think, we believe that uh, if we look at the discrete use cases around payment, supply chain, and digital identity, that blockchain actually has the potential to potentially reduce fraud. Uh, so it could actually get, get better but we don't think it's going to be eliminated entirely. And so let's, let, let me take you through the next few pages to, to discuss in more, more detail. So on the cryptocurrency side, um, the areas that are most vulnerable to fraud are obviously the users themselves and the ramp-up infrastructures. On the network level, uh, it's actually been you know, remarkably resilient, uh, and I think that's you know, one of the benefits of uh, having it as a distributed ledger and in that um, it, uh, it can withstand um, attacks, it can, um, it can actually, you know, it's, it's harder to, to penetrate that network. So the, the, the risks are there, again, are slightly more kind of theoretical. Uh, there is always a risk of rogue mining pools, or if, uh, if a um, series of miners uh, get, uh, get more than 50% of the network control, then potentially that, that could lead to, to, to some fraudulent activity. You know, it's, we've seen already examples of where miners got more than 50%, but so far you know, not much of a fraud has happened in that area. On the other hand, we've seen plenty of evidence uh, in the other examples. On the ramp-up infrastructures, for example, you know, a lot of exchanges got hacked. Um, everybody probably remembers the Mt. Gox uh, story, uh, which was shut down in 2015. Um, you also get a case of uh, fake intermediaries. Um, sometimes uh, companies pretend to be legitimate exchanges, but instead just swindle customer funds or distribute malware. <clears throat> but the biggest vulnerability is, um, is, is in kind of the risk is really on the user side. Um, and that is um, some, of those, uh, some of those frauds are quite specific to cryptocurrencies and perhaps would be difficult to execute in kind of in another way. A good example is, uh, is an ICO fraud, which is a relatively recent phenomenon. Um, in the last year, we've certainly seen a lot of uh, initial coin offerings. Uh, cryptocurrency startups are trying to raise money by selling a percentage of their, their tokens uh, to backers. Um, and we've seen situations where, you know, those uh, so those, those wallet addresses, for example, got hacked and uh, money got redirected and customers, uh, investors, potential investors lost money. But you don't really need to go to unique frauds. You know, there's a lot of fraud that uh, exists today in today's environment that's also very prevalent in cryptocurrencies. And if anything, it just makes it easier for them to, to do that. So phishing and business email compromise, very common fraud in you know, regularly, in, in kind of regular activity. Certainly in Bitcoin, we've seen that as well, uh, where basically you have um, fraudsters putting uh, on an email some links which look attractive. You think that you're going to, to some sort of website where you can spend your Bitcoin, and instead uh, you, know, you, you just uh, give your money away. Um, extortion is another popular area of crime. Uh, I, I remember very vividly the 
um, all, all the news reports in, in the UK, for example, when um, WannaCry took over NHS um, computers and demanded ransom to unlock uh, the files for, for the computer. Uh, money laundering, of course, it's a very big issue, um, and it's one of the reasons why banks have really tried and stayed away so far from uh, from bitcoins. Um, but again, selling illegal fraudulent goods, rogue operators, these are all examples of, um, of fraud that's already happening um, that Bitcoin and, and other cryptocurrencies just, just make it easier. Um, on the other hand, uh, if we look at the enterprise blockchains, and, and there really the view is uh, we kind of have to look at uh, case by case and look at the specific use cases. Um, if, if we look if we take payments as an example, uh, we think that blockchain technology, you know, other distributed ledger technologies, certainly have a potential to reduce counterparty risk, uh, potentially reduce settlement risk, and you know, one of one of the ways of um, improving payments uh, through these technologies is uh, actually improving messaging between participants. And if you can confirm kind of all the relevant details, such as KYC and risk information, fees, effects rates, uh, before initiating the transaction, you know, not only does that improve your straight-through processing rates, it also improves your payments data quality, So, which, which in turn can also then reduce false positives when you're trying to assess that risk of fraud. Um, having said that, uh, that, you're still not protected against bad actors. So if, if if somebody manages to get in get, get into you and actually submit to you as a bank, for example, submit to your fraudulent transaction, um, you'll you'll simply just execute that transaction faster. So you know, blockchain is not necessarily can, can't just stop stop that entirely. Supply chain is is really one of those areas where I think there's a lot of potential to to improve not just efficiency but also on the fraud side. Uh, being able to track uh, goods, whether they are real or counterfeit, um, you know that's 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 why if everybody has access to the same information, that certainly can 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 be a very very helpful uh, authenticity of of goods. Also, the the fake invoices. Uh, we've had examples where um, the UK was facing a potential two billion euro bill from Brussels, um, accusing that um, the UK is sort of. Fa was turning a blind eye on a fraud network uh, which allowed the uh, Chinese goods to be imported into Europe by artificial and under invoicing those those, those goods. Um, so, blockchain, if if you track the the products uh, as well as financial information, can certainly help you reduce those those instances. And the duplicate invoice financing is another one uh, where you know, Standard Chartered even already partnered with the DBS Bank to develop blockchain-based solution to increase trade on invoice transparency and make sure that if I, if I promised uh, to, to one bank, if I pledge this, the, the, that, that collateral already to one bank, I'm not going to get it from, uh, from another. Um, and then finally, on the identity side, um, digital identity is a very hot topic right now. There's a lot of countries, a lot of um, companies looking at ways to improve identity, improve ways to authenticate customers. And uh, again, there's no, um, blockchain is no uh, exception. Uh, there are uh, certainly companies and, and views that people believe that uh, identity, uh, blockchain can be very helpful to help track identity, which um, if, if we're to have that kind of solution, then certainly would uh, help us with account onboarding, account opening, improved authentication, and therefore, again, by, by, by default, that would help, um, understand, help us understand who we're dealing with and potentially reduce fraud. Having said that, we don't believe that blockchain is a silver bullet for fraud and financial crime. Uh, first of all, there's just too many unknowns. Uh, the, the technology itself is, is rather immature. Uh, we're still waiting to see what kind of impact it will really have once it goes into the production. Um, and you know, there's, there's, there's a nice quote here uh, from Financial Stability Oversight Council, that, uh, which stated in its 2016 annual report, saying that market participants have limited experience working with distributed ledger systems, and it is possible that operational vulnerabilities associated with such systems may not become apparent until they are deployed at scale. Also, although distributed ledger systems are designed to prevent reporting errors or fraud by a single party, some systems may be vulnerable to fraud executed through collusion among a significant fraction of participants in the system. Um, 
and that's that's certainly true i mean that's um it's um, once once you a proof of concept in a pilot can can be very different environment from from once you go live into in, into the world um it's also going to take take some time to materialize um alenka gave a view a view as to how how this will develop and we certainly expect over the next few years uh, the, the, all those efforts to ramp up um but at least it's still going to take take some time to materialize and again i think we can't really forget the ingenuity of criminals if 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 there is something that the uh, technology ad- adoption history that taught us is that um fra- fraudsters are very very creative and the 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 fraud prevention financial crime prevention is is a never ending battle so as soon as you close down one avenue for fraudsters another one springs up so you know they're looking for the next weak link and i think our view is that uh, most likely the the infrastructures the solutions will probably coexist for the for the foreseeable time being so if anything there is a risk that attacks on the legacy infrastructures are going to increase which is um you know why why we think uh, that uh, actually using today's modern tools to f- to fight um crime and financial crime and fraud uh, is going to be very important in the blockchain world as well and we think that something like machine learning and behavioral analytics can certainly be very powerful tools in in in, in those battles um in the example we have here is that uh, is is basically is where those two types of infrastructures coexist so we have a sender that submits a transaction into the sending bank which then sends it on to the receiving bank and and they have a choice of going via a traditional interbank infrastructure you know why is ach uh, swift network or perhaps over blockchain interbank infrastructure you know the point is that that connection between the sender and the sending bank still needs to be checked and make sure that um, you know these you, you know who you're dealing with these are not bad actors and you can catch the situations when when transactions become become malignant so trust and safety will certainly emerge as issues even in enterprise blockchain and you know you 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 just simply have to ask yourself how do i know that uh, that that i'm dealing with with the right kind of companies uh, what kind of tools can i use so we monitor we believe that monitoring behavioral patterns and identifying anomalies uh, will certainly help uh, ensure trust between blockchain participants and on that note uh, i'd like to turn it over to jesus thank you hi thank you jill um Welcome everybody. I appreciate you taking the time to um, to be with us today and, and listen to our to our presentation. Um, so why don't we start? So uh, in this slide, um, I I basically just summarized some of the the key concerns, key areas of challenges and risk. You heard both Alenka and Jill. Um, mentioned them already, but I wanted to reemphasize some of them. And, uh, st- stolen or compromised wallets are, are, you know, were mentioned earlier, and we completely agree that they present a, a, a key risk to, to uh, the compromise that could occur. Uh, if they're stolen, uh, if they're compromised, if, co- if end users do not follow safe practices, when handling and managing their wallets. Uh, the information can get stolen, can get uh, compromised in such a way that the whole blockchain itself then could, could be impacted. Uh, Trojan software, another major area. Uh, you know, we know that the impact of Trojan software and what it can do today. You know, we've all heard of malware, ransomware, you name it, it it's all over the place, the bad guys have figured out a way to get in and sit there and wait for you to do something that they can compromise. Uh, we have already seen and heard of Trojan software, for example, that monitors your clipboard, uh, the Crypto Shuffler Trojan, the Coin Bit Clip Trojan. They all sit there and monitor your clipboard, and whenever you do something that, that includes a wallet or Bitcoin addresses, they replace it with ones that they supply and, and therefore uh, are able to get in. Uh, it was mentioned earlier as well, uh, blockchain is, is new. There are a bunch of new implementations. Some are better than others. 
uh, based on what you pick, uh, you could end up picking uh, something that is not written as well as it should be. And therefore, you end up with compromises there. Uh, I think it was mentioned earlier, and we agree, the players are going to change. So the one that you pick today may not be around uh, uh, in, in a few years. So again, those implementations are, are going to be and need to be tracked. You need to make sure that they, they do all the right things. And then again, hacking of the exchanges was, was mentioned earlier. We've seen multiple examples of exchanges going out of business where they were hacked, you know, in fact, some of them multiple times before they went out of business. And, and, so, and, and, and a lot of money was lost. So it's critical that all of these uh, challenges and risks are taken seriously. Uh, I think and Jill also mentioned something just just now, which we fully agree with. Uh, the benefits of blockchain will take time to materialize, as they pointed out. Uh, and in the meantime, your legacy uh, systems are going to get attacked more and more. So therefore, the need for leveraging technologies like Guardian Analytics to protect your current existing financial systems is key. So it's important that you don't forget about that. So, uh, I, you know, questions for I guess for the audience is: Are you tired of your AML system producing so many false positives? Are you having to staff your AML team so that you can chase all these false positives and alerts that are being generated by your, you know, solutions today? You know, how many rules does your AML system have? How long does it take you to update them and test them? Uh, you know, how often do the guys figure out what the rules are and, and therefore you are scrambling to to change the rule to, you know, to cover the gap that has been identified. So, you know, the answers to those questions are, 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 are you know, are hard when you realize and when you determine the cost of maintaining your systems. We have spoken to many of our customers and have heard their frustration. Uh, as such, uh, we have developed the Guardian Analytics Evidence Link platform. This is a modern AML platform that leverages the latest technologies like machine learning, which was mentioned earlier as one of the key technologies to protect yourselves. Uh, Bitcoin tracking and, and analysis, fuzzy logic to identify and, and connect uh, people together and in transaction, link analysis, and, and many others. These technologies and this product are going to enable our customers to successfully and seamlessly complement what they have today or replace it, those, ex those silos that they have today uh, of tools and data, and they'll be able to replace them with a modern AML platform for the future. The evidence, the AML evidence link works by ingesting the data that exist in your silos, all your transactions, payments, customer information, et cetera, as well as connecting to other external sources. Uh, it continuously monitors and analyzes all this information across the blockchain, the blockchain using machine learning to protect the general ledger and the smart contracts that are moving through the, through the blockchain. Our behavioral analytic analysis provides risk scoring and alerts, which uh, can be used by our customers in their AML efforts. The alerts, as well as all the ingested data and records, are retained to, to meet record keeping requirements, as well as, as for future reference. So let, let's talk a little bit about. Uh, how behavioral analytics and, and machine learning works uh, to identify fraud. Uh, machine learning models and algorithms follow uh, well-defined patterns that, that have been used and, and defined across the data science space. 
Uh, the model collects user data from online activity and transactions. This data allows the model to learn the behavior of each user. E each new user activity provides the model with more information to learn, such as you know, the location where the transactions are being made, the amount of the transaction, what type of computer is being used, type of browser, uh, the recipient, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All of this information gives the model more information to learn and, and, and track. When a new transaction is made by a user, the machine learning model and algorithm compares the behavior of the new transaction against the already learned behavior across many data points. I mentioned a number of them earlier, type of computer, location, etc. If the behavior is an anomalous, meaning it doesn't fit the pattern that the system has seen in the past from this user. The system flags the transaction so that it can be reviewed. This allows fraud analysts, AML investigators, and others to take action to mitigate the risk and, 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 and learn from it so that uh, we can prevent it from occurring in the future. Uh, you know, so our platform knows that customer A uses a PC and logs in to online banking from home only in the evening, on the evenings. When the system detects that this customer is now trying to log in from an iPhone in some other country, uh, it, it recognizes that this behavior is, is unusual and therefore is able to flag it. Uh, this may not be a noteworthy behavior from another user that does that all the time. So again, the, the whole reason for behavior analytics analysis. Uh, this unique approach leads to fewer false positives, the higher fraud rate capture rate, and, and, and improves efficiencies across our, our customers. Uh, if you recall earlier in the presentation, both Alink and Jill pointed out the, the high risk associated with crypto, cryptocurrencies and public blockchains. As I mentioned, the risks have already been demonstrated. There's plenty of examples of them occurring. Uh, we completely agree, and, and that's the reason we are focusing in this area. Additionally, from an AML perspective, uh, what we and the regulars care more about is the source of the funds coming into the financial institution that goes to the cryptocurrency exchange and how the funds that come from the cryptocurrency exchanges to the financial institutions are being used. So all of this information is being tracked and recorded. So, you know, a couple of more questions. You know, would you like to know if your customers, your banking customers are making transactions associated with cryptocurrencies? We've heard from our customers that they do. They want to know that. So our product will allow our customers to monitor the transaction associated with cryptocurrencies for their own customers. So instead of relying on hundreds of rules which have to be maintained and updated constantly as sophisticated criminals figure out how to avoid them, our ML solution will apply machine learning and behavior analytics to these transactions to help detect, detect suspicious activities that will trigger AML processes as well as enhance your KYC and EDD processes. By leveraging our machine learning, we will have the ability to assign a risk score to the different AML alerts, which will reduce the false positives generated by existing rules-based systems and will help our customers prioritize their investigations. At Guard Analytics, we truly mean business when it comes to protecting our customers' financial assets. With more than 450 financial institutions as our customers, ranging in scope from millions in assets to 600 plus billion, we analyze the behavior of over 40 million commercial and retail account holders and protect over 5 billion in banking activities each year. Uh, making us the number one behavioral analytics platform for fraud detection. So that's my last slide. With that, I'll turn it back to, to Eric and, and our audience for questions.
Thank you, Alenka. Thank you, Gilles. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, this open up the Q&A session. Uh, we already have a couple of questions from the audience. One is, um, what blockchain use cases will accelerate in 2018? Any expected watershed events? Um, I think, you know, uh, Alenka, you, you, do you mind answering, addressing this question? I, I'd be, I'd be happy to. Um, I think we're, we're definitely going to see more in production, low value cross borders, especially in high remittance corridors, so Southeast Asia, Middle East. Um, we could potentially see a couple companies start using it for intra-company exchanges. Um, I'd say my boldest thought is within a couple years, I think sooner than a decade, we'll see a central bank issue a cryptocurrency. That would, I would consider a watershed. Great. Um, any, any example of current banks initiatives that are in the U.S. at least uh, would bring to uh, uh, our, our attention? Um, less in the U.S., um, largely because we're so dominated by domestic payments and we have very efficient payment systems. Um, I would point to initiatives out of India like Axis Bank and Ripple as um, proving cross-border work for low value. Um, okay. Thank you, Alenka. Um, there's a second question here. Um, there's a lot of fraud currently in retail payments, especially cards. How do you see cryptocurrencies and blockchain affecting retail payments? Uh, Jill, I think it's right in your alley. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Eric. Sure, happy to, to take that. Um, well, I think um, when it comes to retail payment, I, I, it probably depend, depends exactly what we mean by retail payment. Alenka alluded to low-value cross-border payments. Um, you know, that's potentially involving retail customers and helping retail customers. Um, and certainly, there's there's an opportunity there. Um, I think the you know at least when I think about retail payments, it's uh, uh, can I can I go and shop um, and buy things from merchants today using cryptocurrencies, or in the future, do I expect to be using cryptocurrencies to, to transact for my day-to-day -day shopping activities? And certainly for the last few years, we've seen a number of merchants uh, kind of announcing that they are willing to accept Bitcoin uh, for transactions. Um, I would say that most of those have been probably more for the PR value more than anything else. Um, I think Bitcoin in particular and just cryptocurrencies in general, I think they're still not sufficiently user-friendly uh, to, to transact, uh, considering that um, for you know, general public to, to hold cryptocurrency and actually actively transact them um, in, 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 in a great kind of scale is, um, is, is, is quite hard. Um, and also, the network is not quite ready to support that. Um, there was a time, of course, when Bitcoin transactions uh, were minor. Uh, sorry, the, the cost for the transaction fees were minor. Now those transaction fees are in the tens of dollars, um, and, uh, and and the, the network is certainly suffering from the scalability issues. So for for, for real retail transactions, for, for Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency to really challenge Visa, MasterCard, I think we're a very long way away from that. Um, where, where I can see some of this potentially creeping into the, the, the retail pay payment space is uh, perhaps either using blockchain technology as a, as a settlement rails, so again, cross-border payments you know, via Ripple, for example, or um, perhaps for some still valuable transactions that, that are not necessarily hard dollars. And I'm thinking loyalty points, um, just some, some gift cards, perhaps uh, some of those which, again, require multiple participants to be involved in the transaction. 
um, where distributed ledgers could provide gen genuine value. Um, yet, if if you know if something went wrong, it's or if it's if it doesn't happen, the, the settlement doesn't happen instantly. It's not the end of the world. Um, so I think that's that's another opportunity for to, to keep an eye on using cryptocurrencies and blockchain for for loyalty and, and those kind of issues. Okay, thank you, Shell. Uh, there's a third question here about blockchain encryption. So if blockchain encryption cannot be hacked, why would you need fraud and uh, money laundering detection? Uh, I think it's just... <clears throat> so this is actually a really good question. Uh, you know, you wonder, what, you know, why would you need this? Uh, blockchain encryption is actually pretty good. Uh, as an example, Bitcoin uses SHA-256, the secure, secure hashing algorithms, which is strong encryption. It has not been broken, so, so why should we worry? Well, the interesting part is that it, the reason for concern is not necessarily the encryption itself, but when you think about other secure systems and what compromises secure systems, it, typically the concern are the entry points into the secure system. So in this case, we talked about earlier the entry point into blockchain, into Bitcoin in some cases, is, is these wallets that are, that are being used to hold the, the information that, that allows you into the, into the chain. Uh, we talked about how Trojan software can be installed and then gave a couple of examples that, that it can be used to steal the wallet or impersonate the owner of the wallet. Uh, because these wallets can be stolen, uh, just like, for example, bank account information can be stolen. Uh, it is critical then that fraud detection, money laundering detection be put in place to protect the users from themselves and then obviously the institutions that they do business with. Yes, I think that this is actually a very good question because what what it really hints at is that fraud in Bitcoin or blockchain will probably be pretty similar to current fraud payment uh, detection, uh, where you know machine learning would work only if you have the intelligence on uh, and the knowledge on uh, those fraud schemes. Even though you learn the behavior, the the identification of the fraudster is something that. Uh, you would need experience in. And this is exactly what Guardian Analytics is, is good at. You know, we've been here quite for a while now, since 2011. So we do have our own network of intelligence going after that, that uh, you know, fraud scheme uh, network. Um, this uh, wraps up our, our, our webinar today. Um, let me just show you the last slide to close this webinar. If you want to contact us, uh, Success at guardianalytics.com is, is the, the best uh, email access. If you're going to contact Celan, uh, you have the email here of uh, Ken killed up at Celan.com. Uh, please uh, rate our webinar to uh, enhance them and so that we can propose other exciting content. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>